Living a life of intention starts within. Dora and I are excited to help you find the path to co-mindfulness living through our co-mindfulness masterclass. Our seven co-mindfulness principles will take you on a remarkable path towards health and happiness. For more information and to sign up for the masterclass, visit comindfulnessproject.com. People are yearning for information, having the opportunity to encourage people and to educate people and inspire people. It's amazing to be able to say we'll carve out time to take care of ourselves. There's something for everyone. Hi, I'm Trisha, and Dora and I are excited to share an exclusive episode on Health Gig from our 2020 Co-Mindfulness Virtual Summit. Our 2020 Co-Mindfulness Summit was packed with information from world-leading health and lifestyle experts. In this episode, we are excited to share Dr. Tracy Freeman, BBNR's own Chief Medical Officer, and her presentation on reducing stress through the use of adaptogens and other natural remedies. Hello, I'm Dr. Tracy Freeman. I'm going to talk to you today about herbs for stress. First, let's start with defining stress. Dr. Google calls stress a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or demanding circumstances. Basically, it's overwhelming your system. It has psychological as well as physiological and behavioral effects. Per the Mayo Clinic, stress causes anxiety, depression, restlessness, feelings of being overwhelmed, irritable, anger. You can lose your motivation or focus for events especially you see people who are overreacted to situations. It also has physiologic effects where your muscles become tense, you have more pain, fatigue, low sex drive, your stomach can become upset, that kind of telling feeling in your stomach that something's wrong, you get headaches, you don't sleep well, chest pain in the form of panic attacks can occur as well. And behaviorally, you can start to undereat or lose your appetite, overeat, or kind of graze through the day. You can start to use drugs or people abuse alcohol a little bit more than they would normally. Smoking is a way to escape or social withdrawal if that's your go-to method for coping. And other people just have outbreaks of anger when they're under stress. Effectively, stress kills. When they studied a thousand healthy men over 18 years, what they found is that men who had less than two episodes of stressful events per year, they did okay. But if you had three or more, which three was a moderate amount of stress, or up to six some people had, the mortality for all of those people was increased. The same study also found that men who were married lived longer, and that men who drank a glass of wine a night live longer as well. But overall, if you are able to maintain a balance and not an overactive stress response, you're more than likely live longer. So the fight or flight response is a response of the adrenal glands. It's when your body gets into preparation to survive and live in the threat of something dangerous. This gland will release hormones called cortisol and adrenaline, and these have effects that were designed to be short-term. So it'll increase your heart rate, your blood sugar levels will increase. It's kind of like a fuel to get up and go. Your breathing rate will go up, your blood pressure will increase. And this is all well and good as long as it's just for a moment in time, as long as it's not long-term. But what happens when this becomes chronic? Chronically, we see chronic elevations in blood pressure. We call that hypertension. Chronic elevations in blood sugar, that's diabetes. It also causes obesity. We can have heart disease as a result. Cancers have been linked to stress. Illness, because your immune system has gone awry, happens. And in other words, you get more colds or flus or things of that nature because your system is on the wrong path. I always tell my patients the body keeps score. So even though you're not in a stressful event right now, it's easy for your body to maintain stressful habits, effectively become hypervigilant. So even though something horrible happened two years ago, you haven't trained your body to come out of that situation. It's about moving along and telling your body that we're safe, we're okay. The chronic stress mechanism, it's basically the body prepares itself for illness. It gets the, what we call cytokines and things of that nature up and running to protect you. But over the long term, that becomes inflammation. And we know that inflammation is the basis of disease. And they've been found that chronic stress basically will change your genes. So that affects you on a cellular level. And this is the basis of how stress leads to inflammation, leads to disease. 
obviously life's hard. And the question is, now what? How do we deal with it? Certainly the first step is to recognize the problem, to name it. And then it's important to kind of take it layer by layer to peel the onion. You want to find and eliminate the sources of stress for you. And they can be physical, emotional, psychological, situational, environmental. Whatever they are, it's best to kind of name them and then look for baby steps where you can take away as much as possible. It's important to make a plan and adapt that plan because you can honestly become so stuck on what you think is best and important that that becomes a stressor. So it's important to forgive yourself, be kind to yourself, adapt, and do small steps as much as possible to get easily towards your goals. In conventional medicine, this, what I'm about to talk about, adrenal fatigue doesn't exist, but in alternative or functional medicine, we discuss adrenal fatigue. And that is basically when the body is burnt out, when you're run out of gas. And what you'll see is that you'll stop being able to sleep at night. Your body thinks you're sleeping in a cave, so it wants to wake you up to be hypervigilant, to say, protect us, you know, a wild animal or predator is coming to get us. Some people will gain weight. The body's preparing for a famine. Other people will lose weight because the body's preparing to outrun a cheetah. You start to crave salt as this process goes on. And part of the, what the adrenal glands does is send a signal to the kidney to say, hey, hold on to your salt and then pee out acid. But if that system's not working all the way, you'll pee out salt. And so you start to crave what you're losing. With that salt loss, you start to feel lightheaded as you change positions. Like if you bend over to tie your shoes and stand back up, you'll feel a little woozy. And generally, this out of gas feeling causes fatigue and brain fog, can lead to that fight or flight feeling, which translates to anxiety or just a complete burnout in which you feel depressed. So, the adaptogenic herbs are used often to treat this adrenal fatigue. There's so many studies on these herbs and they're so fantastic. Unfortunately, most of the studies are small, but we're gonna go through each of these herbs and discuss their benefits. But I wanted to emphasize, it's important that you talk with your physician to find out if these herbs are right for you because you may be on medications or have conditions such as diabetes, which lowering your blood sugar even more like these herbs do wouldn't be good because you could run the risk of being hypoglycemic or have a very low blood sugar. So the first one we're going to talk about is rhodiola. There were studies in 2011 and 2012 that all together followed 575 people. With those studies, it was shown to improve the person's mental focus and physical performance. It does this because it increases circulation, so you get more blood flow to the brain, so you're more sharp to the muscles, so you're able to swim longer than you would have been able to swim or run longer than you would have been able to run. At the NIH, they have an organization or a part of the schools that they have there for complementary medicine, and they studied rhodiola versus sertraline, which is an antidepressant and against also a placebo. And what they found that rhodiola was equivalent to sertraline against depression and didn't have the side effects. As with most of these studies, it was a very small study. It was also found to facilitate the hormones in the brain so that they can be transported where they need to go, as our antidepressants do as well. It's shown to decrease the release of adrenaline, so it stops you from having that fight or flight response. The typical dose for rhodiola ranges from 200 to 500 milligrams once or twice a day. You'll know you've gone too far if you feel overstimulated. Ashwagandha is an extraordinarily popular herb. It's especially used at nighttime for people to get some sleep, especially those people who are waking up in the middle of the night. It lowers cortisol, and cortisol is our hormone that comes up if all things go well, kind of goes in the morning with the sun rises, and then as the day goes down, it goes down to nothing at bedtime. But some of us, that response is happening a little too early, and ashwagandha will help to curb that so you can get a good night's sleep so that the cortisol isn't waking you up. So in small studies, it's been shown to improve depression, anxiety, help people with stress. It also lowers cortisol. Interestingly, it helps men's testosterone levels, but didn't do that to females. It's interesting that it kind of works in the paradigm that's needed, whether you're a male or a female. In the placebo-controlled study, ashwagandha was shown to decrease stress and anxiety and insomnia. It lowered cortisol like the other herbs, so the rhodiola and the other ones we'll talk about. 
Interestingly, it helps with weight loss because it stops food cravings. So if you're interested in dosing ashwagandha, it's 250 to 600 milligrams once or twice a day. Holy basil is known as Tulsi. You'll see Tulsi tea in the store. Those are based with holy basil and have other herbs as well. It's considered the queen of herbs. It has been shown to also decrease stress. It has positive effects on your cardiovascular, immune system, neurocognition, diabetes, metabolic. It lowers your blood sugar, lowers your cholesterol. It has a lot of effects and works as a antioxidant and antimicrobial and it lowers cortisol as the rest of them. So therefore it lowers your stress hormones. It is an amazing herb, also can be used to keep you sleep through the night if you're waking up with that hypervigilance, just like ashwagandha. The dose for holy basil is 400 to 500 milligrams twice a day. Siberian ginseng is called also eleuthero. It is also used to increase exercise endurance, so it'll increase blood flow to your muscles and decrease fatigue. It improves circulation to the brain as well. It improves your memory, cognition, and concentration and focus. It'll lower your blood sugar. Again, remember the fight or flight response is something that gets your blood sugar up and running. And in this case, if we kind of blunt that effect, your blood sugar will stay normal. And it adapts to your stress levels. So there are certain times in which you can go overboard with it, in which you get hyper-stimulated with it. So you have to play with a dose with this. The dose for this is one to four grams. That's a large variance of dry herb divided throughout the day. Shishandra is a berry that's been shown to be an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. It regulates your neurotransmitters as well. It's been shown to protect your liver and decrease alcohol cravings protects your brain from degeneration and depression, and it's been shown to lower cortisol as the rest of them, but its mechanism for increasing blood flow is a little bit more known in that it increases nitric oxide. And that is just something in the body that dilates blood vessels. So that would lower your blood pressure and improve blood flow. Obviously, if you're on blood pressure medications, you want to monitor that and be careful with Sushandra. And overall, it's going to improve your cognition as it works with the brain. CBD deserves an honorable mention here. It's definitely become much more popular. There's so much CBD on the market, and that's the cannabidol from hemp. That is available widely. It's legal in all 50 states. It turns out we have the system called the endocannabinoid system in the brain, and all of us have that. And it turns out pretty much all the animals have it as well. So in some level, we're designed for this. It's been shown to help improve stress, improve sleep, improve anxiety. It's been shown to modulate the adrenal hormone response. It helps with depression, anxiety, blood sugar, and neuroregeneration. I just heard a lecture about using it for people with brain trauma, brain injury, to help them to rebound from that. It's important to talk about helpful foods as well. So of course, fish is on the menu because fish has omega-3. You wanna get foods with zinc in them as well. Zinc is important because there's a zinc and copper balance within the body. If you have too much copper in your body, then from dopamine to norepinephrine in the brain, that's from feel-good hormone to norepinephrine, which is fight-or-flight hormone. That is spurred on by copper, and zinc will put that in check. So zinc is a very nice mood balancer in some cases. Other supplements that will help are magnesium, all across the board, calming, calming to your muscles, whether you have asthma, it'll calm your, the muscles in your airway, or you're having cramps, it'll calm those muscles as well. Even muscular cramps when working out, an Epsom salt bath, which is magnesium, helps that. Vitamin B6 works with magnesium, helps magnesium to stay in balance. It also helps with the GABA receptors, which are also very calming neurotransmitter. Inositol and niacinamide are both forms of the B vitamin, niacin. Inositol typically comes as a powder. The dose of that can range anywhere from 500 milligrams to 6 grams three times a day at most. It is very calming. So it, it, without being sedating, it's very easy to take someone away from an anxious fight or flight state, but oftentimes you walk a fine line between being calm and awake. 
And the way we do that is with inositol often. You can stay awake and be alert without feeling like you need to go to bed. It's been used since about the 1950s when doctors realized that they were detecting something in the urine of people who have uh, psychological issues and they noticed that inositol and niacin and niacinamide would take that away. They called it at that time the moth factor. Even to this day, these are very much used along with zinc in calming the brain. So the curcumin is another thing you can use. Curcumin, of course, comes from turmeric. It's best taken with fat, with a meal. Black pepper helps it absorb. It's extraordinarily anti-inflammatory. And somehow anti-inflammatory translates to better mood, to feeling more calm, to feeling better and having a happier outlook. The vitamins A and D, vitamin A also has been shown to be anti-anxiety. And then the vitamin D does everything, it seems like these days, but the vitamin D also seems to have a very good mood balancing effect. There are other supplements I like. L-theanine is from green tea. Uh, that is also very calming. You can take typically 200 to 400 milligrams of that with no problem. It goes very well with GABA. GABA is also anti-anxiety, very calming. I can recall one time giving a theanine GABA cream to a patient of mine who was extraordinarily anxious and in front of my face, he starts to cry because he's got so much relief from his sense of anxiety and stress that he, of course, took that bottle home and continued to use it. Tryptophan and 5-HTP, they're precursors and help the serotonin, which serotonin is the happy hormone, the one that we target with antidepressive. And for that reason, you don't wanna take these if you're on any kind of antidepressant. It'll be too much of a good thing, so to speak. But at the same time, they're so calming in certain doses, they can be used for sleep. 5-HTP in particular, we use for people to bring their mood up, to balance it. And it's interesting, the more you need it to feel happy, it doesn't make you feel sleepy. But as your body gets better, the more you take it, you may need it at bedtime because it will make you feel sleepy. It's an interesting effect that actually kind of transitions you to feeling healthier and happier. Rescue Remedy is the Bach flower remedies. Bach was a doctor in the 1800s who was depressed and laid down in a flower bed, realized that the flowers made him feel better. So he began, this was the latter half of his life, studying the rest of his life, the flower remedies. And this Rescue Remedy is a combination of all the remedies. So the Rescue Remedy is, I think, best done in a spray. They have drops and they also have gummies but I witnessed it at an autism conference and where an adult autistic was having an outrage moment. And I watched a five foot woman walk up to him and spray rescue him in his, in his mouth and he just calmed right down. The other calming herbs that deserve mention are valerian. Valerian, of course, you think in terms of Valium, which is a prescription drug there, it's a kind of made from valerian. St. John's wort has been studied greatly for its anti-depression effects. And when I was in residency, we had to do something called Journal Club. I chose to present an article on St. John's wort versus one of the antidepressants. And the article read, St. John's wort fails as an antidepressant. But when you actually looked at the data, it did better than the drug itself. And this was against people with the highest level of depression on scales that were used. And yet the St. John's Award of all the things that were studied did the best. Passion flower, it's very calming. It can be found and used as a liquid, a tea. Pretty much all of these things can be given as a tea, especially if you're sensitive. Lemon balm, also in the essential oil world, is called Melissa. You can use that as a tea, as a pill. Also, the essential oil, Melissa, you can put it on your skin for absorption. Chamomile is well known to be calming. Uh, the only thing about chamomile, it's been found that it's not something you want to take all the time. You should give your body a break from it. Essential oils are always easy. They're great for children because you could just kind of put a diffuser bedside at night or perhaps put a little in their feet. I will say that lavender had one study which it was shown to create gynecomastia, which is breast in boys. But the reality is it's been questioned because they were putting the lavender in plastic. And of course, plastic is an endocrine disruptor in and of itself and essential oils are solvents. 
So when you put the lavender and the plastic, were you giving them just lavender or was there plastic in there as well? There have been other studies that have come against that, but I, because it's in the air, I just mentioned it. But it is probably the grandfather of all calming essential oils. The chamomile, similar to the tea, is very calming. Vetiver is an essential oil for focus and attention, especially. It's probably the ADHD remedy, but also very calming. Rosemary has been shown to increase attention and lower stress. They studied it in two classrooms, one classroom with rosemary, one classroom without, and found that the rosemary classroom in six weeks was having better grades than the one without. Geranium, likewise, very calming, kind of anxiolytic, or it takes away anxiety. Frankincense, I mean, since biblical times, has been shown to not only help with calming and stress, but also there's some studies on it with being anti-cancer even, and bergamot as well. Most of these things can be combined if needed, and certainly placing it on the skin, there's really no harm. Some of them do need carrier oils, meaning like a coconut oil or something. So that would be something I would suggest to just Google out or buy it already mixed and ready, like a roller ball that you could just use as needed. I like to put in hormones because it's important to know that your hormones could play a part in your stress response. So women who have low progesterone, in this case, again, from an alternative medicine perspective, there's something called an adrenal steal. So that is where the adrenal gland, as we go into adrenal fatigue, will start to take back the progesterone it helped to create and use it. So then you have estrogen and progesterone are meant to kind of live in a balance. But without that, the estrogen is not that it's too much, but it's just more dominant hormone. So you want to bring that back by working on your adrenal glands. But of course, if you have too much estrogen in your system, you're going to be more moody, more snippy, more aggravated and agitated, irritated. So it's important to bring balance into your system. Men with low testosterone, likewise, can become a little bit more weepy, a little bit more sad, depressed, lose muscle mass. And of course, certainly libido plays a role in that with that depression. So we want to make sure that we keep things balanced. Certainly, testosterone, too, has gotten a bad rap, but it looks like the latest data on it is showing that it's cardioprotective as opposed to causing heart attacks. Estrogen stimulates the production and transport of serotonin, estrogen being the main female hormone. So that is going to be important for keeping serotonin, your happy hormone, in place and moving and doing as it's supposed to. The thyroid always comes into consideration. It's a master gland. So whether it's hyper or hypothyroidism, it does affect mood. It does affect your sense of balance across the board and can definitely in the hyperthyroid realm cause anxiety and in the hypothyroid realm cause a depression. So it's something you always want to rule out. When we used to work in the hospital, psychiatry wouldn't take a patient until we ruled out things like hypo or hyperthyroidism and B12 deficiency and syphilis actually as well. But now it seems like that is bypassed. We no longer do that. So other techniques that are worth mentioning in terms of bringing balance to the body are the binaural beats. Those are things you can get, like listen to in headphones, and they are used often for sleep just to kind of calm you down. Emotional freedom technique is one of my favorites. It's also called tapping. That is where you tap on the Chinese meridian systems of the body. So you end up looking at the idea that emotions clog up the highways of the body. And of course, that things start out on an emotional level and then precipitate to physical. That would be a very holistic viewpoint of it. And the way it works is you tap out on different points on your body, like the top of your head, the top of your eyebrows, and on down. As you go through it, you kind of think in your mind, how bad is, say, stress bothering me? And you say, okay, I'm stressed to the level of 9 out of 10. And you tap on all the points going through it, and then you ask yourself again, how bad is it? Maybe it's a six. You run all the points again, and it'll go down to a four, and you do it until it's basically gone. I've seen more miracles with this than anything. I've seen, you know, a person whose home got broken into, having post-traumatic stress from that, go on with their lives after doing this technique. It is very hard to explain. It is best learned by going on YouTube and watching it done, because if you read about it, it really doesn't make any sense. You really need to see someone doing it. 
heart math deserves mention. These are people who honestly study the heart and its impact on the brain as opposed to the brain on the heart. So what they find is that if you can get your heart rate into a steady pattern, the impact of that on the body and your health is the, all they're dedicated to. They even sell uh, clips that you can put on your ear and tap into your phone so that you can bring what they call coherence and come down and be more calm. This should help overall health. It gives you the tool, especially for a busy brain. I think the tapping, if you're a person who's anxious and on guard, tapping gives you a lot to do. And heart math, also with the phone involved, gives a distraction that helps you to tune down the stress hormones that you have in your body. Neurofeedback is something that you can do with a professional who does that. They are people who put electrodes on your head and you either are watching a movie or playing video games on a computer. And as your brain hits peak performance, the screen will be bright. If you go and you're kind of going daydreaming or not focused or having bad reactions, it'll go dim or the sound will go out. So it's training the brain to be positive. And of course, the body's one unit. So the brain has an impact on the body and the body has an impact on the brain. Imagery is good. It's along the lines of like meditation. That helps a lot of people. But I do find that very anxious people, very stressed people can't tune out enough. Their brains are too busy with a to-do list to go to that, which is why I recommend the more techniques that utilize a little bit more, especially the emotional freedom technique. But if you can settle your body, there's probably nothing better than meditation. And even if you start with five minutes a day, then work your way up. Again, baby steps are good. And then again, exercise. Exercise is phenomenal a way, especially of offloading, of getting things out and of course, helping your cardiovascular system, help the muscles and help you to direct your body, helps your breathing. We know that if you can inhale longer than you can exhale, then your body knows you're not in a state of distress. So you can use the breathing techniques with that. Exercise, I do though have some patients that I caution against it initially. If I find that someone is too burnt out, that they've been so stressed out that they just have no energy. This is someone who when they exercise for the next two days they're in bed, then exercise isn't for you right now. You need to take a moment and refuel, get your body into a good position, and then exercise will be good. It'll probably be a month to six weeks, and then you'll be able to deal with life as it comes and exercise like you want to. Thank you so much for listening. To follow me, you can come to my website, which is www.tracyfreemanmd.com. You can also find me on Facebook and Instagram with my name, Tracy Freeman MD. Thank you again. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doro. Be well. To learn more on how to live a co-mindfulness life, visit comindfulnessproject.com.